So today we kick off Life Lessons from David. I am so excited about this. The, the Life Lessons from David, I just kind of want to lay this out a little bit. If, if you grew up anywhere around the church for any period of time, most everybody's heard of David. Uh, in Sunday school, he was one of the most fa favorite characters. I was just watching a cartoon on, I think it's Veggie Tales or one of the Christian networks the other day, David and Goliath. I, went, I didn't sit down and watch all of it, but I seen it on the screen. And, uh, but anyway, it's, it's a, and if you're a kid, that David and Goliath is usually what you hear about when you think about David. That's usually what comes to your mind, you know, a slingshot. I mean, especially if you're a little boy, oh yeah. You know, that's our slingshot. It wasn't one of these, you know, it was pulled back. But if you're an adult, what do you think about when you hear David? Bathsheba. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and there's, a, there's a great truth in that. There, I mean, all of that's true. David and Goliath and David and Bathsheba. What I'm saying is there's a great lesson in that, and that is this. Our innocence leads us towards what was positive. Our negativity that the world puts us on us leads us what's towards what's negative. I'm not denying that David and Bathsheba, it, it was a terrible story. It was, it was one of his biggest failures. But why is it, as adults, we think about the biggest failure? Why? Not because we're bad people. We are conditioned that way. This is why we got to get a vision for how we think. we got to get a vision to how we see things. Why? Because culture will tell us how to think if we don't. Culture trumps vision. That's why you got to have a strong vision and so you can change your culture. I'm so thankful I got a hold of that vision before I was even, even serving the Lord. I grew up in the sales world, and that was one thing their culture taught me was you don't think about the negative things unless you want to head that way. Whatever your mind conceives, it, it, this is not just a scriptural principle. This is an absolute principle. Whatever your mind conceives is what you're going to lean into. Whatever you daydream about is what's going to pull you. This is why Satan fights so hard for the young people's minds. Because he knows that's what will pull them that direction. That's why he puts this crazy music out there. It, it puts these, put these negative stuff in kids' head that nobody loves you. Well, somebody loves you. His name's God. Amen. And so that's the, we got to change our culture to think the good things of God. Amen. And so David, you know, Goliath, we, we're going to talk about all of this in depth. But Bathsheba, but the, the thing with David is this, at the end of the day, no matter all the victories, all the defeats, all the things, and he went through a lot. He's still one of the most recognizable characters, one of the most favorite among a lot of people, because at the end of the day, he was victorious and he was a king. I think we have a fascination somewhat with royalty. I think it's something God puts in us because we're kings and priests. See, in David's time, you couldn't have but one king. Now we can have billions. And on that same lineage that David was a king, so are you. It's through Jesus Christ. Traced the, trace the lineage all the way back. He said, and he told David, he said, upon, on, upon this throne, it'll be an eternal kingdom. We're living in it now. We're not waiting for it. That's another paradigm shift that the church has done a real good job to preach. In the sweet by and by. No, it's here. The same time we'd preach the sweet by and by, we would say the Lord's Prayer. And this is clear as crystal. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. And yet we told people, no, that's way off in the future. You're going to be in misery. No, you're not. Misery's an attitude. That didn't say that wouldn't bad things happen. Bad things do happen. Even to good people but we're victorious. Amen. And we'll see that in David. And then the key verse for all of the, um, all, all, the whole series, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Let it be said of us. That we are men and women after God's own heart. What we were praying at the very beginning. I want to know your heart. 
How do we become a man or a woman after God's heart? Well, first we've got to find out what his heart is. What's important to God should be important to us. Here's the other thing. What's important to you is important to God. Don't forget that concept. If it matters to you, it matters to God. And I love what Sheila said, uh, Philippians 4, 19. It's, it's according to his riches, not ours. It's according to what he has. And, and so don't never get bogged down with, I wonder if, if God's really concerned with this. Yes. He's concerned with the little things. And if you want to really um, get rid of your unbelief just, and you really want to build your faith muscles, just begin to believe God for the little bitty things. The little things. You know, I want to do this and it worked out financially. I want to have, I want to have, this, uh, I want to have this experience. I want to get to know this person or, or whatever it is. And then, and, and then just exercise your faith. Amen. Let's get started with, with David and some life lessons here. I'm, I'm going to be reading from 1 Samuel uh, verse, uh, chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And if you wonder where that's at in my Bible, it's page 269. <laughs> but if you don't have my Bible, we may be on the wrong page. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, and I'm going to uh, probably do verse by verse. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I probably will, because uh, there's a lot of good, good stuff here. If you wanted to title the message today, I guess you could say, be, being faithful in the little things, or to be faithful in the little things, and God brings promotion. See, more times than not, we're just, we're just taking care of what God's put our hands to do, and then all of a sudden we get promoted. I've seen people, and you probably have too. I don't believe any of them's here this morning. Pray, pray that you're not one of these. Still looking for a promotion and hadn't done the last thing he told you to do. God, God's got a great memory. <laughs> I mean, really good. And, and you say, how do you know that, Pastor? Because I've asked him for things, and, and then I'd ask him for something, and then he'd always come back with, I'd get this prompting in my spirit about the last thing I didn't do. I remember for the first three years, I'd go to the mountain, or at least two, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it was two or three, I'd go to the mountain on, in around October, November, get a vision for the church the next year. But, and, and, and I always used to do two or three days. Now I may do a half a day or a day because it's kind of rolling now, you know, and, and, and gotten better at hearing him on a daily basis and a monthly, you know, and all that. But anyway, when I first go, all God wanted to talk about was my family. I'd ask him about this and he'd remind me about my family. I'm like, could we move on? What was he saying? You need to change your attitude, boy. I can get stuff to you, but I can't get it to you until I get what's in. What, I can't get to you until I get what I need to get in you. See, God don't want to work through us till he gets something in us. Just like this morning, you get more in you than you recognize now. But listen, there will come a day where what you're getting in you today and every day will manifest. And all of a sudden, God can bring his dream to pass. It's, it's, it's on the job training. God doesn't waste anything. I mean, he, you're talking about the, the, the 12 baskets they picked up? That's, that speaks of the volume that God doesn't waste. The guy had a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. But they, they fed, you know, they estimate 15,000. It says five, but if there's a, one, a wife and one kid, that's 15. They didn't count the women and children. And yet they, picked, they fed all of those and then they picked up 12 baskets. What does that speak to? It speaks to your life. God doesn't waste anything. Even the, things, even the things that the enemy tripped you into, tricked you into, tripped up your life, and you went through hell maybe for a couple of years or 10 years or a couple of decades, whatever it was, once you, once you get sold out to what God wants, he doesn't waste any of that. I'm still picking up pieces of things God taught me when I was so lost and undone, such a heathen, and God will still remind me of lessons I learned back in those days. He doesn't waste anything. And it's all, it, it, while the enemy's trying to destroy us, 
God's all, oh, I'll use that. Oh, yeah, I'll take care of that. And honest, just before God and before you, some of the greatest lessons I've learned about pastoring was before I was ever Christian. <laughs> God was teaching me. He knew I'd get to. My, see, here's the thing. God has a foreknowledge. He knew I'd end up at the right spot. Now, I still now don't confuse this because some people today confuse this. It doesn't mean that I had to end up at the right spot. I still had a will. I could have backed out on it. But what I'm saying is God knows what we're going to choose. He doesn't make us choose. It's, it's like he's got if you could. I like to look at it this way. The DVD's already cut. In God's mind, because he, already, he knows the beginning to the end. But we were the ones that determined what we put on the DVD. Are you with me? Because some people preach that God stamped that DVD and that's the way it is. Get over it. I don't believe that. There's too many whosoever, whosoever wheels in here. Yeah. If you be willing, you know, things like that kind of go crossways to that kind of thinking. But anyway, let's, let's start off here. I, we've done started off. Praise God. I'm just excited. First Samuel, you're there. If you're not, you are a slow finder. <laughs> Get your neighbor to help you if you're not, because I, it took me about five minutes there. So, <laughs> First Samuel 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I have selected one of his sons to be my king. Now, a couple of things. Samuel, the prophet of God, was still mourning over a rejected leader. There's a lot in that right there. Sometimes we want to keep following people that God's moved us on. Not necessarily rejected them as a leader, but moved you to a different season. They say statistically, one of the hardest Folks to pastor, if you ever go into a pastorate and, and you get appointed to a, a church, and if the pastor died while pastoring that church, they say it's the hardest position to ever fill. Because everything the new pastor says is weighed out against the friend they had for all those years. So in that sense, it wasn't that God rejected them, but the point of the story is this. We need to quit mourning the loss of something that's gone. Because it, it will, and I, I know this from experience, uh, I, I started serving under one pastor after being best friends with my other pastor friend that I had moved on to a different season years ago. And I kept going over in my mind how much I enjoyed that relationship with the other pastor. And finally the Lord showed me, you're not moving on, you're still holding on. People do this in relationships. They, their, their relationships moved on or, or they, you know, if it's boyfriend and girlfriend, they hold on to that. They all, you know, have you ever noticed how God, all, I mean, how the enemy, not God, the God of this world, how the enemy always points out all the good, the past relationship done, and he never brings up the negative. But when you're in the relationship, it's vice versa. If you, if you just take that, we could go home right now and I promise you to help you in your life. Tremendously. If you'll just train your thinking to know, just like with Bibi, if God's if 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 the enemy's pointing out what's wrong with her, I've got to make a conscious decision to turn that around and realize that's the enemy trying to cause strife. If I'm thinking about an and I don't sit around thinking about old relationships, but how many of you know the enemy will bring them up? Let's be big boys and girls. It happens. And when that happens, what happens? It's always the positive side of it. Always, God gave me this little illustration years ago. The same enemy, or verbiage, if you will, the same enemy that causes you to jump the fence is the same one on the other side that tells you you made the wrong jump. And these are just little things if we can get our mind around and start focusing and training our mind to do that based on the heart condition. 
Because how many of you know, once the heart's right, we want the mind to line up. If you're trying to line the mind up without the heart being born again or, or the relationship with Christ, that's an impossibility. But it's still better than not thinking right. But it's still not going to get you to where you need to be. He said, find a man named Jesse who lives there, and I have, for I have selected one of his sons. Listen to verse 2. But Samuel asked, how, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Now, I want you to notice, you can always tell in the Bible when someone's in faith and just asking a question so they'll know how to do something versus not believing God can do it. And the way you always know is God will give the answer right after they ask the question. It won't be a rebuke or the anointing won't leave them. God will give them the answer. Samuel's asking the question. He said, how am I going to do this? He knew the protocol was this. If he went and done that and, the, and Saul's in, in his, in, in, still king, he's going to get killed. And they didn't have a court. Saul was the court. The jury, the judge, the whole deal. He said, take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which one of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at, arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Why did they do that? Because in the Old Testament, when a prophet showed up in town... <laughs> it may not end well. It may not end well. Don't you, just another reason to shout because we're in the new covenant. Amen. Amen. Can you imagine Prophet Samuel's coming to town, coming to Salisbury today, and everybody's like, oh. Can you imagine if, with what's going on in the world today, if we still lived under the old covenant and God said, I'm sending a prophet to this town? Because what the prophet would do in the Old Testament, in many cases, that, that the, the sins had reached the, 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 the ears of God, if you will. And what he'd do is he'd just come in and pronounce what God was about to do. Now, why did he do that? As awful as that was, it gave people a chance to repent. God still had grace in the Old Testament, even though it doesn't look that way. Lack of grace is not telling them about what's about to hit them. See, we live in the, in the age of grace, but it also says when the Lord comes back, he's coming like a thief for those that don't know him. Why? Because he's given all these thousands of years as warnings. And there's still people walking around today that thinks God's going to come visit them again before. Listen, if you've heard the gospel one time, you've heard the gospel. There is no, there's no promise in here that you'll hear it again. Are you with me? All right, so let's keep going. So he said, what's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. <laughs> we still do that today. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't, you, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. A couple things here. One, quit wrestling with that truth. Figure out how to compensate for that truth. What do you mean, Pastor? He said that men will look at the outward appearance. Don't argue with what God said. He said we'd do it. So how do we compensate for that? We get in the Spirit. We do what the Apostle Paul talked about in the New Testament. He said, I judge no man by the flesh. Now, this will solve a lot of our problems. If we can, if we can pray about relationships, if we can begin to see people as God sees them, Do you realize if, if churches were, were hiring today that Jesus could not be hired in the church? 
I'm not talking about this church. I'm saying some of these churches that put out resume. Why? He has no Bible college. He's not married. And, he had, and, he, and when he walked on the earth, he had had no previous church experience. It's a good thing God looks at the heart, isn't it? Now, I'm not saying anything's wrong with any of that stuff. Obviously, there's not. But see, you can have somebody with all the qualifications, and if her heart ain't right, you really don't have nothing. I remember years ago, I was a sales manager. Me and another manager were working together. This was years ago. We was running the number one office in the world with, with the fire detection industry. And me and him interviewed these two ladies. And one of them had all of, I mean, dressed to the T. I mean, just very professional, as professional as it gets. Said all the right things. I mean, just almost flawless in the interview. And then the other lady we interviewed the same day, they were actually friends. She didn't have any of that going on. None of it. I mean, it was day and night. And so after we interviewed, Gray looked at me and he said, what do you think? And I said, Mary can do it. He said, what? He wasn't even going to hire her. I said, oh, she'll, she'll do it. She'll do well. Well, what about the other one? I said, I don't think so. I said, I'm fine that we hire her, but I don't, I, don't think she'll ever, I don't think she'll ever really achieve a lot because of attitude. And uh, sure enough, it played out just like we've seen it. In the, it, it. I wasn't even serving the Lord, but I had a knowing in my heart because you, can, you, you, you don't have to be that deep to get it. Just listen with your heart. You're a born again believer. You can listen with your heart. I'm not talking about you have to pray for four hours to get spiritual discernment. You just need to listen with your heart. And long story short, Mary became the first woman in that industry to uh, finish in the top 20 for the year all over the world. She had something you can't train people to do. Desire. You can put, I've, I've trained so many people over the years. I've discipled so many uh, Christians. But I promise you this. Unless a person has the want to, you can keep throwing it at them all day long and nothing's really going to change. They're, they may get a little bit better. But let me tell you something. A man or a woman with the heart for God, after God's heart, determined that nothing's going to stand in their way, they will fulfill their destiny. Why? Because God's anointed it. He didn't send a prophet over to your house and pour oil on you, but when you got born again, you got anointed. The Spirit of God came on David. He came in you. Think about that. He would, when, when you say in the Old Testament the Spirit of God came on someone, that just meant for a brief moment for them to get the job done. Now the Holy Spirit lives in us to get the job done every second. That's why Jesus said in John 16, 7, he said, it's going to be a lot better for you when I get out of here so I can send the Holy Spirit because he'll dwell with you forever. See, he's not even going to leave you when you're raptured. That's how you're getting out of here. That's exciting. Praise God. Then Jesse told his son, Abinadad to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemiah. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Now, it's important you underline or remember this, the Lord has not chosen any of these. If you back up to verse 7, in the first verse there, it says he rejected him. Understand this, God was not saying, okay, I reject you, I reject you, I reject you, I reject you. What he was saying is, I chose David, and by default, you are rejected. It'd do us good in life to just get that lesson. 
I, I see people in churches sometimes. Ed, I know you've seen this traveling around. That God set a pastor in the house and everybody's still arguing over it. Or you're in a ministry and somebody, God, God puts his anointing or his call on that person to do that. And everybody's like, well, I don't agree. Well, you need to talk with God. It's not because, but here's the point. Human nature is we feel rejected. We shouldn't feel rejected. We should press in and say, what am I called to do? Yes. This goes back to the simple lesson we learned about thou shalt not covet. We shall not covet another man or woman's gift. Bless them. See, listen, there's people all over this world that do it better than I do as a pastor. But I don't get my eyes on that. There's people that speak so much better than I do. There's people that can, can do things and, and be a better or God called me here. And I'm not rejected because I'm not called to pastor. I'm not pastoring a 20,000 20, member church. I'm not saying I'll, I won't pastor that. It may take me longer to get there. Jesus may be back before we build to that. But none of that matters as long as you know every day you're doing what God called you to do. That's all that matters. And it really doesn't matter what endeavor you do. This would be a good conversation to have with God. God, how did I do today? Based on what you wanted me to do. But he what the other sons, the seven sons were not rejected in a sense of, of, of God saying, I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like, no, don't think like that. One had to be king, and it was David. Now, why was David chosen? Because he had a, a, a heart for God. In the same way, all seven of the sons, uh, the Lord had chosen these had not chosen these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? Oh, there's a great truth here. <laughs> there's a great truth here. I'm about to encourage you if you'll let me. Listen to this. There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out there in the fields washing the sheep and the goats. Oh, there's a great lesson here. Don't you ever ever, ever, ever think because of your background or your education or your looks or your size or any of the above, any of that, don't you ever think it determines how God will use you? Because God don't look at that. Men do. But men that will get in the spirit will quit. But God will never quit looking at what's in the heart. That's why we don't put on a show. That's why, that's why we're pur purposed in our heart around here to, to let everybody know it's not about what you wear. It's not about where you work. And, and, and I've purposed for 16 years to never look at a man or woman's tithe or offering. Why? Because I understand the truth of that scripture. I don't want to have to wrestle whether I'm looking at you based on what you give. Why not just remove that from the equation and I don't even have to fight that battle. And I've not had to fight it for 16 years and won't, and won't start fighting it. When I look at you as far as giving, I figure you all give the same. And you do if you, obey the, if you obey the Lord. What do you mean we all give the same? I mean you give what God instructs you to. And that's all that matters. That's just one point. But we, don't, we set ourselves up sometimes for failure by wanting to look at the wrong things. Parents do this with their kids. There's kids that's been damaged terribly because someone knew in their heart this was Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. And because of their background or their education or their finances or whatever the case may be, the parents say, oh, no, that can no, no, it's not, that, nope, 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 never ask God. Are y'all with me? See, we can change. And it's really not that hard to change and be more like God. All we got to do is ask. He said we have the mind of Christ. God, what, what do you think in this situation? Mm -hmm.